Before the 911 emergency phone number existed in the United States, if you wanted to report a crime, you needed to dial the seven-digit phone number of your police station. Same if you wanted to report a fire, but with the fire department. This also very often had to be done using a rotary phone, which was this phone that had a slow spinning dial that you had to turn to each number, wait for it to cycle back, and then dial the next digit. Very time consuming. Today's story is considered the main reason why a 911 emergency hotline was created in the first place. This story has been requested by both L. Rodwell86 and Jeff Sachs, so I thank you for your suggestion. As a fair warning to you, the viewer, you're probably going to get mad multiple times while watching this video. Some of the content is very frustrating. And because we'll be covering topics like assault and murder, viewer discretion is advised. Okay, let's get into today's story. Catherine Genovese, who went by Kitty, was raised the oldest of five children in Park Slope, which is in West Brooklyn. She attended an all-girl high school in Prospect Heights, which is another Brooklyn neighborhood just northeast of Park Slope, and she did so in the early 1950s. She graduated in 1953. Shortly after this graduation, Kitty's mother actually witnessed a murder on the streets, and this really traumatized her. And because of this, the Genovese family decided it would be best to move somewhere else where they felt safer. However, this was a problem for Kitty because she was engaged to be married the following year, but she was still living at home. And so the family arranged that she would live with her grandparents in Brooklyn while the rest of her family moved to Connecticut. Kitty did end up getting married in 1954, but the marriage was very short-lived because Kitty came to the realization that she was actually a lesbian. And so the married couple got an annulment and then they went their separate ways in 1956. And Kitty ended up getting her own Brooklyn apartment. Now, in order to pay for this apartment, she found work doing several clerical jobs, including working as a secretary at an insurance company. But nothing truly felt appealing about any of this work, and so she decided she would try her luck as a bartender. As a little side hustle, she tried to make a little extra secret money by accepting bets from bar patrons on horse races. But she did end up getting caught in 1961, and she was arrested for it and had to pay a fine. As a result, she also lost her job. It wasn't easy finding another bartending gig, but she was able to find one. It was just nowhere close to where she lived. This bartending job was in the Hollis neighborhood in Queens, which is a very small neighborhood that's only two neighborhoods west of Nassau County. It didn't make sense for Kitty to make such a long commute living in her Brooklyn apartment, and so she moved again. Kitty proved herself to be a model employee after this initial bookmaking arrest. In fact, she was soon managing the entire bar. She started even working double shifts because she had dreams of one day opening an Italian restaurant of her own. One night in 1963, she went out to a bar in Greenwich Village that operated as an underground nightlife spot for the LGBT community, and there she met a woman named Mary Ann, and the two of them really hit it off, and it wasn't before long that the two of them were actually living together in an apartment in Kew Gardens, which is about a 20-minute drive from where Kitty worked. Something the girls really liked about Kew Gardens was that it was considered to be a very safe neighborhood. Even though Kitty hadn't witnessed the same murder that her mother had, there's still an associative trauma that comes from that, and the idea of feeling safe was very important to her. She was a small girl, she was only about 5 feet tall. On March 13, 1964, so about a year after meeting Marianne, Kitty finished her shift at the bar. It was late, it was about 2.30 in the morning, she closed up, she got into her red Fiat, and she left for her apartment. Nothing seemed out of the ordinary, very much the same trip that she had made hundreds of times before. On her way home, a traffic light turns red on Hoover Avenue, which is not far from her apartment. Kitty stops, she waits for the light to turn green, but little did she know, she was being watched. Parked on the side of the street was a man sitting in a white Chevrolet Corvair. He got a good look at Kitty in the driver's side window while she was stopped, and he decided he was going to follow her. When Kitty got home, she parked her car in the parking lot for the railroad station, which was across the street from her building. Meanwhile, the man pulled around the corner and parked his car at a corner bus stop. He then got out of his car with a hunting knife. Kitty began walking toward her building, ready to walk up the flight of stairs to her second floor apartment. There, she'd be able to crash for the night with her sleeping girlfriend. But then she saw this man, spotted the weapon, and ran for it. She bolted toward her front door. The man ran after Kitty and easily caught up to her. He was much larger than she was. And once he overtook her, he took that hunting knife and plunged it into her back twice. 
Writhing in pain, Kitty was able to scream into the quiet city night, Oh my god, he stabbed me! Help me! Remember, it's after 3 a.m. at this point, and miraculously someone did hear her cry, and a light turned on in one of the apartments above. A neighbor named Robert Moser raised his window from the 10-story building and shouted, Let that girl alone! And the man, fearing that his identity might be compromised, fled the scene. Several other window lights had turned on from the commotion, but then Kitty staggered through the alleyway to the back of the building, hoping to muster up the strength to climb up to her apartment to her girlfriend. And once Kitty disappeared into that alleyway, all of those lights that had turned on, one by one, began to go back out. Nobody checked up on her. What these neighbors did not know was Kitty got to the back door, entered the hallway, but an additional locked door inside prevented her from going any further. She didn't have the strength to find any of her keys and just kind of collapsed in front of a neighbor's apartment door. About 10 minutes later, the white car that had sped off to escape the crime scene came back, and this time the driver walked down the alleyway, found Kitty inside, and stabbed her several more times while also forcing himself onto her. An intoxicated man named Carl Ross was inside of his apartment at the time. He heard a commotion from the other side of the door, and after curiosity got the best of him, kind of inched his door open just a little bit and got a look at the assailant. Ross immediately closed his door and called his friend to ask him what he should do. His friend's response was to not get involved. When the assailant was finished with Kitty, he stole $49 from her and he disappeared again. Ross leapt out of his window at the time and went to a neighbor's apartment because he was scared. Shortly after the attacker left, a friend and neighbor of Kitty's found her and called out for someone to call the police. And now finally, Ross heard that cry and phoned them from the neighbor's apartment. An ambulance arrived by 4.15 a.m., but at that point, it was already too late. Kitty was deceased. Marianne was awoken by the police in the middle of the night and then was asked to identify Kitty's body. Carl Ross had returned to his apartment at this point while Kitty's lifeless body is just kind of laying there with a sheet over her. So he invited Marianne into his apartment and he fed her liquor until like 7 in the morning because it was the only thing Marianne could think to do to numb the pain of losing the loved one that she just did in the way that she just did. 7 a.m. is right around the time a detective finally arrived to ask Marianne some questions. Carl Ross was arrested during that initial questioning because he was being too invasive of the detective's process. And then a few hours later, Two different detectives named John Carroll and Jerry Burns had follow-up questions for Marianne as well, and the questioning soon became highly inappropriate. It didn't help that Marianne was probably a little intoxicated for this questioning, but the detectives were able to deduce that Marianne and Kitty were sexual partners, and so their questioning really focused more on their sex life than the murder. The questioning lasted six hours, and by the end of it, even though there were plenty of eyewitnesses who had given a description of the guy responsible, Marianne was considered a suspect. There had also been an early report of a phone call to the police between the first and second attack, but the description of the scene was so vague of details that the police kind of wrote it off as a lover's quarrel that would resolve itself, and they didn't even show up. And in the next few days, the attack and murder would appear in newspaper articles that were right around 100 words in length. So it's very easy to skip over the story if you're kind of just skimming through the paper. And then the picture that they used of Kitty was very often the mugshot that she had to take when she was arrested for bookmaking. So these papers were making her out to be a lawbreaker. Then on March 19th, so six days after the stabbing, a man named Raul Cleary was minding his own business in his Ozone Park neighborhood in Queens. Ozone Park is less than a 15-minute drive to Kew Gardens. And Cleary saw a man exit sitting a neighbor's house and putting a television set in the trunk of his white car. Cleary asked him what he was doing, and the man said that he was a removal worker and was taking things from the apartment because the family was moving. Cleary didn't buy this story, and he confirmed with another neighbor named Jack Brown that the story was a lie. That family wasn't moving. Brown knew how to disable the car so that it couldn't drive, so he did that while Cleary phoned the police. The car belonged to a 29-year-old man named Winston Mosley. When the police arrived to arrest Mosley for burglary, an officer got a good look at the car, and he thought that it fit the description that eyewitnesses said that they had seen the night of the Kitty Genovese murder. While in custody, he was asked why his car fit the description of the assailant's car that night, and he confessed to not just killing Kitty Genovese, but two other women in Queens neighborhoods over the last nine months. He gave details that were not available to the public. When asked what his motive was, he simply responded that he just wanted to kill a woman because they were easier and didn't fight back. Although knife wounds in Kitty Genovese's hands might have suggested that she did in fact fight back. The reason he committed the crime so late at night was because his wife was a registered nurse and worked at night. And 
His three kids were asleep, so this was a family man committing these crimes. Then, after a psych evaluation, there were suggestions that Mosley may have actually been a necrophile, which is a person attracted to corpses. While he was charged for Kitty Genovese's murder, it was complicated for the other two murders he confessed to because another person had also confessed to killing one of those women. On June 15th, Mosley was sentenced to death for the murder of Genovese. The judge for the trial even said, I don't believe in capital punishment, but when I see a monster like this, I wouldn't hesitate to pull the switch myself. His sentence was later reduced to life in prison. Now, because of this case, three major changes resulted, the first of which was a study on the bystander effect. On the day of the original indictment, Abe Rosenthal, the New York Times Metropolitan Editor, had lunch with the police commissioner, Michael Murphy, and Murphy told Rosenthal all about the murder and how shocked he was that so many people had done nothing even though they were witnessing a crime. An article was printed up on March 27th, 1964, so two weeks after the murder, and the article claimed that 38 witnesses saw the murder and didn't call the police. Even though the numbers were inflated, and we don't really know how many witnesses there actually were, the Times sold a lot of papers. It drew a lot of attention. The Times also warped some of the statements made by the witnesses they interviewed. For example, when they spoke to the neighbor who physically held Kitty in her arms when she died, they asked her if she would do that again. Assuming that they meant, would she hold her friend's head in her arms as she died again, she replied, certainly, of course. But the paper wrote that she would never get involved again, period. Even though this reporting was a blatant stretch of the truth, there was some good that came out of it. It got people talking about Kitty Genovese. Her name would have easily disappeared into the papers. Instead, it launched an entire investigation into why someone would witness a crime and not help the victim. This phenomenon goes by two different names, the bystander effect or Genovese syndrome. Clinical experiments went on to show that the more witnesses to a crime that there are, the less likely people are to help. They just assume somebody else will help. That, or they assume they aren't going to be very helpful because they don't know what to do. This may have been the case for Carl Ross, the neighbor who shut his door and ran for it. However, Marianne offered up another potential explanation in a book she published decades later. Marianne said that Carl Ross was a closeted gay man. He had been drinking that night at a gay bar and likely feared the police in a time when gay life was very dangerous. Luckily, the press never made mention of Kitty's sexual orientation, or the entire story may have disappeared completely. But because the story did make national news, the bystander effect has been studied extensively and is still taught in psychology departments today. And the more people know about the bystander effect, the more likely they are to actually help somebody in a time of need in the future. People would rather not be on the wrong side of a life or death situation. Another change revolves around transferring prisoners from prison to court or to a hospital. While in prison, Mosley showed up to the prison infirmary with discomfort in a particular private area. Because as it turned out, he had several items, including a can of spam, stuck inside of himself. I'll let you put two and two together on your own. Mosley had to be taken to the hospital to have these items surgically removed. And when his recovery was complete, he was transferred back to the prison. But along the way, Mosley attacked the officer delivering him stole his weapon, and made a run for it. He was able to escape to a house nearby where he hid for three days. And while there, he committed two more assaults on women at gunpoint. He made a run for another house, held a family hostage, but gave himself up when the police finally caught up to him again. Today, there are protocols in place such as needing four officers to transfer a prisoner who must be handcuffed, and the transport vehicle needs to be equipped with restraints. The last change revolves around an easier way of reporting an emergency, the 911 phone system. Before the 911 system, a caller had a few options for reporting an emergency. They could either have the seven-digit number handy for local law enforcement or fire department, or they could dial zero to talk to an operator, although this often led to being transferred to the wrong station because of confusion in high-stress situations. Not only that, but if you're in a city like New York, Dialing zero doesn't exactly give you priority over someone who's just looking to contact a repairman. Those crucial seconds could be the difference in someone's life. The last option would be to find an emergency call box if you were out on the streets instead of in your home. It was the belief of the New York Times that if it had been easier to contact the police, that maybe Kitty Genovese could have been saved. AT&T proposed the idea of using 911 as an emergency number because it wasn't a zip code anywhere, it was easy to remember, and it could be implemented quickly. We use the term quickly loosely here, because even still, it took four years after Kitty Genovese's murder for Congress to approve of 911. That doesn't mean the entire country had access to it either. By 1979, only 26% of the country could dial that number. 
That number didn't hit 50% until 1987. And as of last year, there is still 1.1% of the country that does not have access to 911. Then there's enhanced 911, which means the dispatcher is automatically given the caller's location, which can once again save crucial seconds. And that is currently available in 96% of the United States. Kitty Genovese's murder has been talked about for decades, and those are just some of the reasons why. Kitty Genovese was buried in New Canaan, Connecticut, the city her family moved to in the 1950s. She was 28 years old. So that's going to do it, folks. Thanks again to L. Rodwell 86 and Jeff Sachs for your suggestions. If you got something out of today's story, please let me know in the comment section below. And it always feels weird to ask for a like on these kinds of videos, but please make sure that you do because it's important that stories like Kitty's be heard. Also, please subscribe to the channel so you don't miss out on any future NYC stories. And until next time, there's the skits.